All right, so let me uh, better explain myself about talking to the audience like a friend. What I mean by that is as an experiment, picture your friend that you're talking to or picture, I'll give you an example of why this could work. So there was an actor that I worked with that was one of my coaches named Ron Lieberman or Liebman or something like that. Anyway, he won a Tony for Angels in America. And what he did was there was a monologue that Tony Kusher gave him and so he kept struggling with where or like he kept struggling on who he was talking to in that particular monologue in the play now i haven't seen the play but i've heard his critique so or i heard his uh response to it i guess you could say so what he did was he called tony kushner and tony kushner was on a mountain hiking and he said who am i talking to in this particular monologue to the audience who, who who am i talking to and tony kushner who was a playwright says i don't know and basically hung up so he had to find something so he pictured his dog so he was talking to his dog now that worked for him we don't know he didn't step aside and said i'm talking to my dog in this you know this little section of no we didn't get that but he was talking to his dog and that connected him to the piece and he got a Tony for it. That's what I'm talking about. You know, yeah, a dog can be your friend or it's just a specific thing that you're talking to. It's specific. So, and what I see in so many cases is people just talking to the audience and it sounds exactly the same in almost every single one of the, the, all these little plays, you know. I saw this Edgar Allan Poe piece just recently, the theater piece. And it just seems like they're talking to the audience, which is, you know, kind of interesting or whatever, but they don't really ever, it doesn't sound like they're talking to themselves or to someone else or to God or whatever it is that they're talking to. It doesn't sound like they've chosen. And if you, if you set the actor down and say, well, who are you talking to? They'll say the audience. Well, if it says in there, there's a reason for to talk to the audience. And that might, there might be something like chorus line or certain plays, like maybe even cabaret or something, you know, where maybe they are talking to the audience. And then, and then yeah, I understand that. But in certain aspects, it never sounds intimate. It never gets your attention. When you have an actor come out and it sounds like they're talking to someone when they're talking to the audience, it captures your attention more. And there's less like active energy that's being kind of wasted and all this kind of mouthing and talking and mouthing and facial expression and stand here and make a gesture and take the chair and move it this way. You know, all of that's been done millions of times over and over again and what they call that that's called a theatrical convention and okay, that's the vernacular it's known as a theatrical convention it's like planned it's been done and what peter brook would call it is deadly theater because there's no personal connection with anything and so how do you make it personal well you have to bring your own personal life into it to a certain extent you have to bring your your own person into it and then, you know, there's different techniques every actor has. I'm not saying that everyone has to do emotional recall or everyone has to do sense memory, but it's at least that in it alone is activating the imagination. At least it's doing something rather than just memorizing lines, uh, you know, doing like a vocal uh, sound. And it's just all these mechanical repetition things over and over. When you start throwing in your imagination or however you do it, then it starts to go somewhere and you shouldn't even really be aware of it. Like, you know, you shouldn't be self-conscious of it. You should let all that go so that you forget yourself and you go somewhere with it. Personally, you probably wouldn't really be aware of it. It's, it's pretty craziness when you really do like a real kind of performance. That way, you know, when you do it, you kind of lose yourself and you're not thinking like, how did I sound or how did I look? All that goes away. And then you're living in some other kind of moment. It's kind of like going into a parallel universe a little bit. It really is and to a certain extent. You, you'll see it when it happens. You'll know it. Also, another thing about theater is like when you do something interested or I'm sorry, I'm going to rephrase it. When you're interested in something, when your focus is interested in something, then the audience focus is interested too. So when you become interested, then the audience becomes interested as well, like with you. Same thing with film, really, but, you know, so that, that 
you know, the need to try to interest the audience, it's different than you, you finding interest, right? When you're trying to interest, that is a different thing and it doesn't always work. It's when you find interest, you know, they're following you into this thing. So you have to find interest in what you're doing rather than to just simply entertain. Now, Brando did say, Marlon Brando said, you know, the reason that there is the actor is for entertainment. And there's some truth to that because you have to go back and realize what he's talking about. You're not like purposely trying to bore, you know, but you're, you're finding interest and you're, and then you're also thinking like a creative technician. Well, I wouldn't say creative technician, but you're thinking creatively, you know, you're using your imagination and then they'll come along with you. And it, so it's a, it's a working thing. It's like building anything. It's like, it's like, it's like crafting a statue. It's like, it's like writing a song. It's like doing a ballet dance. It's, it's all of those kinds of things. It's, it's an active thing. Now it's not the same as those things. Right, so don't get confused and think that it's the same as sculpting or the same as ballet or it's the same as dance or something like that. But it's along the same ballpark kind of thing. It's an active thing, right? So you have to get up and kind of do it. And I think I'm a big believer in rehearsal. So I think, especially theater, the more rehearsal you have, the more you start to kind of find those things in rehearsal. And you carry a mental notebook of inner objects, things that you think about. You carry that along like an inner monologue. Those things you carry and you build in the performance. You can't see them. You can't show them to the director. You can't really even show them to the audience, really. But you can experience them. And in that experience, then interest comes about in your own little thing that you've created. You become interested. And then all of a sudden, they're like, well, that was a great performance. That's because the person was actively engaged and something was going on with them, you know, in the performance. And it wasn't just them mouthing words. Stanislavski talked a lot about that when they brought the Moscow Art Theater over to America. He was exploring all these things and they, they had done that for certain reasons because communism was such a horrible thing and their own country. So if they could show people how they really were, they felt like they, they could make some type of change in not only society, but in, in the human condition. So it was important to them. And, you know, Russia still has problems, but the Moscow Art Theater was the one that brought it over here and then we explored it with them and then we, that's when the group theater started and we started to develop these different techniques that are still developing even today. Because you don't have to use the same techniques, you can invent your own. And I think every actor should have their own. They should invent their own way of doing things. All right, 6.30, 6.30, three minutes, 1.1. So right now, since I'm kind of vlogging everything, I'm staying at a calorie count of about 700 for the day. Then I'll have dinner, which will be probably about the same, as long as I don't snack or have any chips. We're looking at about 1,400 calories per day that we're gonna try to shed uh, some of this baby fat. Um, I've done it a few times. So the, the, the most I've ever gotten in my entire life was when I was I guess in my 30s, probably like around my, like 36, I got 257. And then within that next year or so, I got down to 150. So I lost more than 100 pounds. I lost about 107 pounds. And I've jumped up and down a few times, probably a little more than Tom Hanks. They're from California right there. It's these guys right here. Now, this weight loss was uh, that I lost when I was 257. I got down to 150, um, and I'm six foot. Now, the rumor on on Castaway is Tom Hanks was 225 and got down to 170. I don't I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what the, that's what they say. Now, with Bulb, what I did was I was at 257 pounds. Did not start recording until 227 or so. 
and then I recorded video wise from 227 down to 150 pounds. It's all on video on Kenjin Pigeon One. You can see the weight loss on it. So that was just one of the things I did. And I still haven't um, put that into narration. Uh, whether it's going to be a documentary or a narrative, it's probably going to be a little bit of both. Um, but yeah, I went down quite a bit, about 150 pounds. And it was only over a period of about mm, seven months to eight months or so in the weight loss. And then I shaved off an additional, I got down to about, mm, about 170 for a while and kept it there for a while and then shaved off an additional 20 pounds. So I was about 150 towards the end of that recording. Pigeon, pigeon one, it's been, it's on video. 737, 11 and 5. You're all the way from Colorado. So, weight goal, <clears throat> probably by August, eh, 180 a little under 180 or so, uh, maybe 175, you know, by August, and uh, keep it around there for a while. There's Hotel Auto and Jamel, and we'll just, we're not going to be using like any crazy diets like the, whatever that fat diet was, whatever, we're just going to just cut calories and lower fat, you know, and, uh, and then increase exercise, just kind of common sense stuff. the butterfly right past Westview. All right, we got another one, 843, or 842, 4 and 1.6. So, uh, Sun Kill Moon did a song called Richard Ramirez Died Today of Natural Causes. And there's no drums in it till it gets to three minutes and 58 seconds. Like 358. 
and man they hit that drum hard it's kind of scary but they use all regular instruments to make a scary kind of scene and of course uh guy mark koslick he uses uh his lyrics and his voice to make it sound a little eerie and it's it starts off with the life or the the serial killer richard ramirez until they catch him and then he starts talking about his own life and how he uh he's got to pee 50 times a day and got a death in the family a relative lost a relative and beat him up and needs some love and he talks about how he goes to the bristol hotel he's got the book night stalker he's reading they let him in with, with the with the uh with something in a black cat or something it sounds like he's saying something about a black cat lead him down a hall or something he's doing like research it really sets kind of like a filmic kind of cinematic scene to the situation it's a very good song it's very creative and he must have quite the passion for serial killers just like most people do today watching dexter and all the charles manson stuff like quentin tarantino's once upon a time in hollywood and uh, Zodiac, which was done by David Fincher, did really, really well as a as a, uh, a neo noir. But people are fascinated with crime thriller and serial killers and people killing. This is a really good song. Now, the thing about Richard Ramirez that he didn't talk about is they did catch him in a neighborhood. He flipped out and started running, and he tried to steal a lady's car and punched her in the stomach. Guy came out of the house and grabbed an object and beat him in the head with it and. Finally, when they had him in the back seat, yeah, the cops had him there. They asked him if he, you know, he ever been arrested and things like that. I think he was so scared and paranoid about the people outside of the cop car, you know, the people in the neighborhood that were all yelling at the cop car. He felt unsafe, like they were going to kill him. So he confessed right there. He said, you got me. I'm Richard Ramirez, is what he said. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, that led to another thing, and they got the guy. He was already posted on the news, like on the uh, newspaper, and his face and everything. So when he saw that newspaper in his face, he just started running. And, he just, you know, he didn't talk about it in this, but Mark Kozalek is like an expert on it. He's read a few bios and whatnot. X19174 minutes 1.9. I'll talk a little bit more about Richard Ramirez in a minute. So one of my acting professors at Texas Wesleyan University was Jerry Russell. He was a guy that started Stage West in Fort Worth, him and a guy named Cobalt, Jim Cobalt. But Jerry Russell passed away a few years back and uh, he had worked with a guy named Lou Diamond Phillips. And Lou Diamond Phillips uh, played Richard Ramirez. They also had a photograph of Richard Ramirez, I mean, uh, sorry, they had a photograph of Lou Diamond Phillips in a in a German restaurant that Linda worked at called Edelweiss. They had tore that down and repainted it as if it had never existed. Now, Ramirez was known to do everything for the devil and uh he wasn't really after a lot of money. Now, he did rob some of the people that he killed, but that's what he talked about. And they interviewed him one time. And they asked him if he'd talk about, you know, what he was worshiping and all that stuff. He said, yeah, I can talk about Satanism. Um, power with no charity is what he said. Power with no charity. I'll tell you one thing, there's a lot of people that are like Richard Ramirez. They don't kill people though, but they live in power with no charity. I thought that was an interesting thing that he said. I don't know all the facts about him and all that stuff, but I certainly can learn about it on Wikipedia or read about it, but he was quite the evil person. Now, if they gave Mark Kozalik a black cat when he walked down some kind of hallway i'd like to figure that out if that's what he's saying i have to look at the lyrics to kind of understand what because kozalik was talking about 
but he supposedly followed the footsteps of the guy. He also, Koslick also has some strange lyrics. If you listen to Glenn Tipton, or Tipton, Glenn Tipton, on A Ghost of the Great Highway, he talks about killing a, a, a young lady or something. Something about her blue jeans and a letter or something, I don't know. He's a weird guy, I mean, you know. He does a lot of solo performances. He's just obsessed with, I guess, serial killers and stuff. He also is obsessed with boxing. He likes to look at the boxers and things like that. He's into old boxers and people that, you know, you know, sport boxing, you know, fighting. But uh, they made a movie with Lou Diamond Phillips. It's pretty good. I think they could make another one, but... David Fincher, who did Zodiac, he chose to do the Zodiac, was real creepy. Zodiac is a creepy one, too. But they called Richard Ramirez the walk-in killer, so that was one of the names they called him. He was also called the Night Stalker. All right. So, let's see. If uh, Richard Ramirez died today of natural causes, it's also kind of about the fear of death and just the fear of that kind of thing. I'm going to go ahead and listen to it again. So yeah, I'm re-listening to the lyrics. It sounds like he went to the, uh, Mark Kozalek went to the Bristol Hotel. He said, you, the guy said, you like them all, gave him a key. And a, it sounds like he says, black cat, let him down the hall. They gave him a key and a black cat. I don't know, I have to look at them lyrics, see what it really says. But sometimes I get lyrics confused. But I guess they gave him a key. He was there to study, you know, I guess study the footsteps of a lunatic. Anyway, song did really well, and they played it at Pitchfork Live. It sounded pretty good. You know, Sun Kill Moon, they, they did, I think the live version's better than the studio. But the Pitchfork uh, concert was a pretty good, it was a little festival, and they played it there. It was, it was done a little bit different, but pretty good. He's done some good ones and some bad ones. Uh, but he's kind of one of those guys that's kind of noir a little bit. Noir people sometimes are cynical heroes, kind of sometimes self-interested. I've been reading about noir films like um, Chinatown and things like that. Next one, 933.9, 3.9. 